everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today to our third Fellows Data Byte. Um, I'd like to start by introducing Nicole Cartagna. Um, she is a sign language interpreter and will be signing all of our talks tonight. Thank you for joining us, Nicole. Um, so welcome to the 112th edition of our Data Byte series. Um, if you are here for the first time, Data Bytes is our speaker series here at Data and Society. It's our opportunity to throw the doors open and um, invite people in to hear interesting speakers, and in this case, three of our uh, 2718 uh, Data and Society Fellows, um, which are is, is very, very exciting for us. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about our Fellows program, um, but first I would like to ask, how many of you have been to Data and Society before? Almost everybody, great. Okay, then I'm going to run through this whole thing, the, the intro part really fast, because you probably all know it. Um, for those of you who don't know us, Data and Society is an independent nonprofit research institute. We're focused on the social and cultural implications of data-centric and automated technologies. We work both on research and engagement around that research. Um, we work on a range of topics from media manipulation and disinformation to the future of work and labor. We just put out an amazing report this morning that you should check out called Beyond Disruption. Woo! Um, uh, and uh, we also work on the human infrastructures of AI, we work on health technology and equity, and a number of other issues. So um, if you would like to stay in touch with us, um, there are a number of ways of doing that. We have a mailing list, and you can sign up there for invitations to future talks and events at datasociety.net online. Um, you can also talk to Audrey Evans, who is our network and engagement lead back there. Um, give her your card or talk to her during the reception. Um, very quickly, some housekeeping. The bathrooms, if you need to go, or take two lefts in the back. Um, during the Q&A, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and we will bring you the microphone. We are live streaming. Um, if you would like to not be on the live stream, please let us know that before you take the microphone so that we can adjust. Um, and turning to today's talk. Um, so you've, you've come to Data and Society on a really special day. Uh, we are, we're hosting the third and final in our series of um, three fellows talks. Over the course of June, we've been showcasing all eight of our 2718 class of fellows. Um, the first two talks are online on our website, and you can you can watch them. Um, I just want to say a few words about our fellowship program here at Data and Society. Um, Data and Society's mission is uh, to work towards a future in which the values that that shape technology are visible and intentionally chosen with respect for human dignity and equity. And we do that through conducting interdisciplinary research and um, and also through building the field of actors and increasing engagement around so that knowledge is guiding development and governance of technology. Um, and, and a core part of Data and Society's commitment to expanding the field of actors is our annual fellowship program. Um, the fellowship ensures that, that new connections and perspectives are um, deepening and expanding our community's understanding of the, the challenges and opportunity society faces in an increasingly data-centric world. Um, over the years, our Data and Society Fellows have pursued academic research, they've written code, they've created art, they've brought together communities of um, activists and practice communities, run workshops, and many, many other things. So we've had an amazing group over the past four years, and we have an amazing group coming in um, next year who we're also very excited about. So I would like to introduce you to our three fellows who are speaking tonight. Um, I'll, I'll introduce you in order. Uh, Taeyoon Choi, in reverse order, actually. <laughs> this is Taeyoon Choi. Taeyoon is an artist, educator, and activist based in New York and Seoul. Um, his art practice involves performance, electronics, drawing, installations, and, and as everybody at Data and Society can attest, dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> and that forms the basis for storytelling in public places. Um, Taeyoon co-founded the School for Poetic Computation, 
uh, where he continues to organize sessions and teach classes. Um, second, we have Dirac Shan Mir. Dirac Shan Mir is a Jane Griffith faculty fellow and assistant professor of computer science at Bucknell University. Um, working on issues of data privacy. Prior to that, she was the Norma Willens Hess Fellow at Wellesley College and earned her PhD in computer science at Rutgers University. Her research consists of examining questions about privacy in algorithmic, information theoretic, and more recently, in social contexts. She enjoys challenging herself and her students to think um, more deeply about our nerd privileges and question our unbridled technological optimism. And finally, Gina Matthews, who is going to lead us off today as our first speaker. Gina is an associate professor of computer science at Clarkson University. She is deep in the weeds at the US Association for Computing Machinery, which is the leading professional association in computing. Um, she's a member of their executive committee. She's on the US Public Policy Committee and is a founding co-chair of their subcommittee on algorithmic transparency and accountability. Uh, her research interests are wide ranging from the security of virtualization and cloud computing systems to third party review of software uh, used in the criminal justice system to alternate models for offline data usage. Gina received her PhD in computer science from the University of California at Berkeley and is an ACM distinguished speaker, which seems appropriate to hand off to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming our fellows. Thank you so much, Janet. It's a bittersweet thing to be ending our fellows year. I'm deeply grateful to my fellow fellows. Um, uh, and uh, all the wonderful faces I see in the audience whose contributions I know do so much to make all of the work we're doing possible. I'm going to be talking about algorithmic accountability and transparency with a punchline of it in the criminal justice system. My title is, You're Just Complaining Because You're Guilty, which uh, I will explain a little bit more in a minute. Um, Audrey encouraged me to uh, have some hope in this talk, and it's gonna start out uh, a little less hopeful, but it's gonna end with some good news. So opaque algorithms and platforms are making really big decisions about our lives these days and reshaping how we interact with one another. We see that around us all the time, how we get jobs, how we find friends, how we navigate city streets, um, all of these things are increasingly algorithmically mediated. And when we can't understand the way in which that is done, there is a lot of opportunity for mischief. Algorithms are typically optimized not for individuals or for societies, but for efficiency and for reduced risk for decision makers which in some sense is fundamentally at odds with considering individuals and unique circumstances. And platforms are optimized for advertising and engagement, or in other words, addiction, and not necessarily for healthy human relationships or mental health or healthy governance. What incentives do we have to debug individual cases of injustice? What incentives do we have to identify vulnerabilities and unintended harms? What will it take for us to debug these systems, not just for the people who paid to develop them, but for the individuals about whom decisions are made or the individuals impacted and society as a whole? There's a lot of questions we could ask in this space. What, do, what ability do we have to understand and challenge decisions that are made? What evidence do we even have that decisions are working, the, or that, uh, that systems are working as they were designed to work, and that they're reliable in a specific case? Can we identify when they just have completely wrong information about us? and they're making decisions on that basis? Or can we identify when they might have correct in information, but they don't have the whole picture, and that that's leading them to what we believe to be an unjust or incorrect decision? How can we protect systems against manipulation? 
And overall, how can we iteratively make these systems better when there are so many roadblocks to understanding how they work? and the way in which the, those deployed systems are actually impacting individuals, even if they were developed with the best of intentions. There is a rich s set of evidence that there's trouble, that we need to be paying attention to these things. And I'll, I'll go through just a, a few examples. I'm, I'll be curious to know how many of these examples are familiar to all of you. Um, this picture here, I find, is an interesting one. Um, some researchers do what many uh, machine learning researchers do. They had a set of photographs of dogs and wolves, and they divided them into two, and they lay, humans went and labeled some as dogs and some as wolves, and then they said to the machine learning system, see if you can figure out how to tell. And then they tested the system on the remaining, and they said, oh, it does a very good job of, of saying whether it's dogs or wolves. And in this particular case, it was able to export an explanation of the decision. So it's highlighted portions of the picture uh, that it believes is relevant to its decision. And you can see that it's highlighted the snow. So the snow doesn't have anything to do with being a wolf or not, right? And as I often like to say, uh, we're all going to be dogs in the snow. And we're going to say, I am not a wolf. I'm a dog. And the question is, will we have anyone to say that to? Will anyone care? Will we even know the way in which we were labeled incorrectly? Another example is there's a wonderful paper, uh, man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. Why would I say such a thing? This is what they did. They took not hate speech or heavily biased speech, Google News. You'd think, you know, that's a decent thing to learn from. And they um, digested this text and they built a series of word embeddings that you can play games with. You can say things like man is to woman as king is to, and the system will say queen. And you're like, that's amazing. How did you get that from just ingesting all of this Google news? But then you say things like man is to woman as computer programmer is to homemaker. And then you use those word embeddings to guide the way resumes are sorted for applicability for a job, for example. And the mischief in these cases came in the training data. Another great example is a project, the Gender Stage project, that has shown that automatic um, facial recognition classification of gender is much, much, more error prone on dark skin and female faces because they weren't tested, they weren't built that way. So we have training data, we have testing data, and these have real impacts on individuals and the applicability of these software systems to any particular use. Much of the problem is that we learn from the way people do things and we learn from the past which those aren't bad things to learn from, but they are fundamentally flawed and biased. And if we just slap a label on them that says perfectly unbiased, logical, cool, almost infallible decisions made by computer, then we have a big, big problem. We need to be iteratively improving, debugging these systems. So I began the year concerned about this, and I acted this out by um, working with a bunch of other people to come up with a kind of a high-level set of principles for algorithmic accountability and transparency. And you can read more about those principles if you'd like. They were awareness, access and redress, accountability, explanation, data provenance, audibility, validation, and testing. And I think that was very useful because it's given professionals a place to point to when they say we're building a system and it ought to do these things. We should invest in doing these things. Uh, major professional societies say that this is ethical and this is important when we build systems. So that was good. But this year, I got a chance to be involved in applying some of these principles to a very particular and important case of 
probabilistic genotyping software in New York. That's a long mouthful, right? Probabilistic genotyping software is the stuff that if you have an evidence sample that's collected from a crime scene and you have a suspect and their DNA, will tell you how likely it is that there's a match, right? And things like that can be really, really hard science when you're dealing with very clean samples, you know, a lot of DNA, um, uh, populations you're used to, things like that. But when you get evidence samples that have an unknown number of contributors or are very, very small, um, or perhaps are taken from populations you didn't even test your system on, there's reason to, th there's clear examples of trouble. And these probabilistic systems were designed to come in in exactly those cases, in exactly the cases that are difficult for humans to just look at the picture and see if there's a match. These systems will process the data and, and say whether they think there's a match. So there was a particular software product that was actually developed with taxpayer dollars by um, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner here in New York City. It was called the Forensic Statistical Tool. And it was used for more than five years in over a thousand cases. And all that time, they aggressively um, pushed back against third party review. Even to the degree that if defense attorneys wanted an expert to go in and look at things, under protective order, no dice. You can't go in and look. So you get a number, says you're very likely to be the, the, the perpetrator, and you're going to jail because it's a very, a very trusted system. And you don't have an opportunity to question their math or to go in and say, did you make an error in my particular case? And in many instances, that evidence alone is enough. That's pretty stunning, wouldn't you say? Um, so some good news is that last year, in one particular case, the judge said, yes, you can have an expert witness go in under protective review and examine the system. And they found, you know, they put out their findings. Originally, it was released um, heavily redacted but they found lots of problems. And um, so much so that eventually their, their testimony was released unredacted and ProPublica was able to get the whole source code of that system up on GitHub. So that is a stunning and hard fought victory for transparency. It's interesting to see is who is doing the debugging is journalists and individual defense attorneys, not the system doing you know, aggressive third party review. And I'm happy to say that I'm part of a very multidisciplinary team with lawyers and statisticians and journalists and forensic biologists who are taking that hard won victory of the FST source code being, pub being published on GitHub and getting to the bottom of how much the errors in that system matter. We are doing executable level testing, source code analysis, comparison testing to other systems, especially open source systems. Here, I don't think you can see the details, but I'll, I'll tell you, there's this function, check frequency for removal, that was identified by the, the Nathan Adams who did the expert review in that case. And even if you don't read code, even if you write code, if you just read this, for each data row in the race table, if the frequency sum is greater than 0.97, remove is true. That doesn't sound very good, does it? And it was very much contrary to the way they said the system should be working. Our magic grant is going to work in three major areas, journalism, technology, and in the legal system. In journalism, we're hoping to do kind of exposés, busting the myth of infallible, unbiased decisions made by computers and by DNA, hopefully highlight personal uh, stories. I'm, we're also gonna just write scientific papers comparing the systems. And I'm really excited. We're going to be at DEF CON, as is Nicole translating, I believe, <laughs> um, talking very similar. You're just complaining because you're guilty. A DEF CON guide to adversarial testing of software used in the criminal justice system. We're hoping to get hackers and citizens who can do something looking at these systems. And in the legal front, we wrote an article for uh, the Champion um, 
which goes to all federal judges and def defense attorneys, opening the black box defendants' rights to confront s forensic software. And we're working on language for the procurement phase where bef when, when systems are being purchased to guide big public decisions like this, that you can lobby for source code access or even easy executable level testing or design documents or access to bug databases or bug bounties or so many things that would help. Um, I think I'm gonna jump here to the bottom line, which is algorithms and platforms are increasingly making big decisions about individuals and reshaping our society. We desperately need incentives and mechanisms for iterative improvement of these systems so that when we find harm to individuals and that there's someone who cares to debug, that they don't just say, oh, we don't care about that individual case. It works 99% of the time, we're good, right? And the criminal justice system is not the only place where this matters, but it is a great example of where it matters. So that the only answer given to people isn't just, you're just complaining because you're guilty that we actually get to the bottom of this. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, for that wonderful talk. Um, uh, Janet introduced me, so I'm going to restate my name just in case you forgot who I am. Uh, I'm Darakshan Meer, and I'm a fellow here at Data and Society. I would like to start off by thanking um, all the people here at Data and Society and all of the visitors here who have come to my talk. But in particular, I want to thank the staff, the researchers, the fellows, every person who walked into this space and taught me something every single time I came in here and supported me. I'm deeply, deeply grateful for having been part of this community for the last 10 months. Um, and I'm really looking forward to all the collaborations I've formed here and taking them forward. Um, so I'm gonna start off by constructing a question for us. And hopefully, uh, I think there is hope even in the construction of this question. So here is a community of people living their lives. And in the process of living their lives in the modern world, they are inextricably generating data. Others have called uh, people living in this modern day uh, data bodies. So you can think about these communities uh, as communities of data bodies. So perhaps the, this community of people, they live in a smart city and they don't even know it. Perhaps uh, they use uh, mobile health devices or more commonly known as wearables such as Fitbits and other things. And in the process, they generate data. And here's the question I wanna ask. Why don't we live in a world where a community can come together and decide that it is acceptable for our location data to be used to say, um, study the uh, spread of malaria or Ebola in our community? or that it is acceptable for our wearable health data to be used to study the social and uh, environmental factors that promote or prevent cancer, but that it is unaccept unacceptable for this health data to be used to sell me a product or to track me arbitrarily across the um, mobile ecosystem. Instead, if you were here for fellow Rishabh Nityanand's talk, you know that there is a booming market for cross-platform tracking across the mobile ecosystem. So more generally, the question I'm constructing is, why doesn't this notion of privacy from the bottom up even exist? Okay. And there are a host of complex political, economic, and social reasons for this. But the question I wanna ask is, and the, what I'm specifically interested in, is the practice that computer scientists can adopt where we can even begin to imagine an architecture of privacy that puts, pri that puts consent at, this, at the front and center uh, in this manner, and, let's, um, and let's, let's computer scientists decide and think about the larger political, social, and economic context in which we build technologies. 
And one such context is that of power. So you can see power is in red here, and it's an important concept that I'm going to return to a little later. Uh, but before I uh, talk more about power, I want to give you a sense of the landscape in computer science research that I come from. Um, so in the sub-discipline of computer science that I come from, there is typically an, an assumption that there is inherent value or common good uh, in the existence of uh, personal data around us. For example, the existence of location data can help us create empirical models of how communicable diseases spread around with human travel. Okay. And second, that the utilization of this data, ostensibly for the common good, um, often comes in conflict with privacy, and that could hinder scientific progress. So the interest in privacy comes from the perspective of preserving the potential of common good in data. Okay. So therefore, what ends up happening is in this kind of framing, it becomes a struggle between privacy and utility, which by the way, we quantify both of those notions, and then it becomes a balance between, an analysis of balance between these two notions. Okay, so remember I told you power is going to be really important in here? So the question is, where is power? Um, and I wanna argue that power hides but very decidedly operates behind this, these concept and in this framing. Okay? Uh, the framing of this privacy utility struggle, in the words of cryptographer and computer scientist Philip Rogaway, rearranges power. And I want to make the argument that if we don't think about the power underlying this privacy utility framework more carefully, we are more likely to empower the already powerful at the expense uh, of the disempowered. All right, so I'm going to re-examine the privacy utility framing I showed you earlier and re-examine it from, from this perspective of, uh, of how, it, how uh, power is rearranged in that framing. So um, we're going to re-examine uh, the notion of utility and privacy. All right, um, so let's look at utility. Now, Certainly all kinds of data sets do not enhance the common good. For example, you might say that location data that helps us construct empirical models of how diseases spread enhances the common good, uh, but this kind of location data is, also has the potential of being used for, say, location-based advertising. And when you serve advertisements using location data, you can also use that location to politically profile people, okay? as was done in 2014 in Ukraine, where when protesters were out there in the public sphere protesting, uh, they received a rather chilling message on their cell phones saying, dear subscriber, you're registered as a participant in a mass disturbance. So there is an existing political context here in which this data is being used against uh, the vulnerable when they are trying to organize. Okay. Uh, Moreover, all kinds of data sets that enhance the common good do not exist. So for example, um, there is the non-existence of this data set of the, of the number of, of the people who have been killed by uh, police in the United States. Uh, the non-existence of this data set serves the more powerful by eluding accountability. Okay? So when, when you just use the concept of utility, unless you examine the question of utility for whom and for what, uh, we are hiding these notions of power behind these kinds of concepts. So now I want to examine this notion of privacy from this perspective of power again. Uh, the privacy is not a, uni or the lack of it is not uniformly experienced. Uh, so for example, in the higher education sphere, there are websites that gather information about potential students and then sell that data to for-profit colleges. The for-profit uh, college industry is known to target low-income students, and it is also uh, known to leave students with uh, more higher debts and uh, fewer job prospects. So there is an existing socioeconomic context for privacy here. Okay, so um, now if we think about privacy once again, and think about how can our conceptualizations of privacy, uh, if, if we commit to a notion of 
uh, if we commit to a value of empowering, not the powerful, but tilt the balance in favor of the disempowered, how do our conceptualizations of privacy change? Okay. Um, so what, what are empowering values? One articulation of an empowering value that I find convincing is that of privacy as a public good. So privacy as a public good challenges the notion that uh, my privacy is mine alone and your privacy is yours alone, and instead posits that our privacy is inextricably linked. That the data that a person produces concerns both herself and others. So for example, just by sharing a particular zip code where say two low income students reside, both of them are far more vulnerable to being targeted by for-profit college, uh, colleges. Therefore, it is in the interest of communities to get together and protect their privacy. So Fairfield and Engel, among others, articulate this uh, notion of privacy for a public good and make the case that groups must be given tools to create the public good of privacy and resist the public bad of readily available intrusive information. And when they use the word tools, they mean legal and regulatory tools. The direction I want to take this in is thinking about what kinds of technical tools can support uh, empowering groups to create the public good of uh, privacy. And so this brings us back to the notion of privacy from the bottom up, right? where communities can come together and decide that in a particular technological context, this is what's acceptable and this is what is un unacceptable. Okay. Now, what is, what is entailed in capturing these kinds of privacy rules? How do we implement such a system? Um, so implementing such a system or creating such a system involves uh, both social and technical processes. So you would first need to come up with a social process whereby communities could create or elicit these kinds of rules in particular technological contexts. These could be participatory processes, these could be other processes. And then you would create a technical system that would be capable of capturing these kinds of privacy rules and enforcing them on all kinds of information flows. Okay. In other words, it would be a community-based privacy governance system. Um, and so uh, what we did, what I did this past year was that with um, researcher Mark Latanero here at Data and Society, uh, Jan Schwarzneider, who's standing back there, who I met at Data and Society, who's at NYU. We created a framework for such a community-based uh, uh, privacy governance system. We laid out a framework for it. Uh, and we presented some of this work at a couple of places, a privacy engineering workshop, uh, and it was also workshop at the Privacy Law Scholars Conference. Uh, and now, uh, in addition to this, to this team of people, we also have my colleagues back at Bucknell, Evan Peck and Jennifer Silva. Um, Jennifer Silva is a sociologist of inequality. And what we are doing with this team is we are creating a social, social technical system, both social processes and technical systems, uh, whose purpose is to really illustrate both the social processes and the technical possibilities of of what is entailed in creating an end-to-end -end privacy governance system. So that the goal is to empower communities. And so bringing, uh, wrapping it back to um, the end of my fellowship year and the return of my educator part of me, uh, returning to Bucknell, I have students who are currently teasing out the social process part of it. So this is a team of students who's kind of already working on this process. But I want to return uh, back and leave you with, with this question. I want to highlight this question of community-based public governance. I understand it's a really complicated question. And it has several complex pieces to this entire picture. And constructing a proof of concept system or a prototype of a system um, that uh, a prototype of a privacy governance system is, from my perspective, an exercise in testing the possibilities, both socially and technically. 
But this is not, it's far from a technology only question. It's a really, really complex question. So I'll leave you with this question. How do you support a democratic, uh, community-based public governance of privacy? Uh, I invite you to help me figure out how to answer it, or even figure out if it's the right question to ask, and what other questions we should be asking. Thank you. Hello, my name is Taeyun. I would like to try something before I get started. So can we all stand up? And you're gonna have your right hand and you're gonna point to a place you came from. Let's point to a place you came from. And we're gonna have the left hand and we're gonna point to a place we want to go. And we're going to point back to the place we came from. All right, I think we can sit down. <laughs> Great. Um, OK. I make art as a form of research. This is a thesis of my talk. And a couple of weeks ago, we had a town hall meeting here with all staff and fellows. And Dana Boyd, um, the president, said, Data Society is a basic research shop that does empirical research. I didn't know what empirical research is, so I looked it up. And it's essentially, you start with a hypothesis, and then you test it over time with data and other experiments. And I like to think that storytellers do a similar thing. They start with a narrative, and then, then test the narrative with characters and plots in place. As an artist, I start with a provocation, a question. And then I try it by involving other people, inviting them to collaborate, and having conversations with them. So I focus on this very plastic nature of art. And by plastic, I mean to give form and receive form. So I'm not so interested in static forms of art, but this plastic nature of art. And as an artist, I try to create fiction, because I think fiction is a great place to be. And then also friction. And I try to shift between the two. And I'm really in inspired by a concept called social sculpture. It's this word to describe that social relationship between people become the materials of the artwork. And then the artwork has this potential to transform the society through its aesthetics and through its message. So what did I do at the Data Society for a year? I made dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> so, so along with these two great computer scientists, like proper <laughs> CS professors, um, I made this dumpling workshop and invited other cohort to think about computation from a very tactile and tangible and delicious approach. So think about it this way. So you come to a dumpling shop, you order something, let's say veggie dumplings. Those are instruction sets. And the chef in the kitchen will repeat and abstract the instruction set. That's the basis of computation. And we can get into the details of the comparison between computing and dumpling making. Sorry about the sound. Um. I'm saying I'm passing the memory back and forth as a data path, and I'm a bus between different parts of the computer. Once the instructions are given to different units, they can either do serial processing, which means you're chopping the vegetable and folding and boiling all by yourself, or you could also do parallel processing, which means that everyone does one thing, and they do it really well, and it, they could do it really fast.
And then the process ends with output, which are usually very delicious dumplings. <laughs> and why do I do this? Because I think the pedagogy and performance are closely related. And the way that computer engineering is usually taught are very boring. <laughs> so with the help of the Data Society communications team, we produced this video, which has over 500,000 views online. So thanks to the uh, communications team for that. And I work at the School for Poetic Computation. And our motto is more poetry, less demo. And we invite a very diverse, diverse group of students from around the world to study with us for 10 weeks. And we teach computer programming, electronics, critical theory, poetry. And they're all equally important. And I'm happy to say that we're doing quite well in the sense that I feel like we're making an impact and fostering a new community of hybrid engineers and designers activists. So what do I do there? I run multiple sessions on an ongoing basis. I do administration. And I've recently been focusing on hiring teachers with new d directions for us to go, and also thinking about scholarship models for marginalized communities. And I prioritize that the school is not a one thing, but the students come to the school with their own idea of what poetic computation could be, and they walk away with that. And I had a few opportunities to bring the school to this place and vice versa, and I'm very thankful for that as well. So during the fellowship, I work on the Processing Community Day, which was a large conference at the MIT Media Lab focusing on artists, designers who use computer programming for creative expression. And to me, conference organizing is a social sculpture because it brings strangers together, it's bodies in space, it has material, material nature, and we do things. And I focus on the topic called convening for the first time. It was really important to think about what are the precedents that we could set for the future conferences? What is the we, uh, new code of conduct? How can we curate inclusive presenters? How can we get audience to participate? And this is the, about 200 people. Uh, in the photo, there's about 100 people in the space. And it's continuing without me. And so far, these projects has been about joy and poetics and aesthetics of computing. And while I think that's important, I also think problematizing technology is equally important because tech is not inherently good and tech, in, in, tech education is, does not equate to empowerment. There's toxic meritocracy in technology and then the colonial nature of tech innovation and the complicity of working for tech companies. So this comes to the point of the uncomputable. Who gets to be computed, counted as a person, categorized? and represented, and who gets to resist computation. And I've been writing about this, especially in the context of disability community, because you know, the tech products are usually presented as like, oh, this is going to solve disabled person's problem. But in fact, they don't actually ask or involve the disabled people into the research and development and just come up with a technology first. So I wrote a piece for the new inquiry called Artificial Advancement. Basically saying that when the tech focuses on cure instead of care, it's not good for the people who, who need the tech the most. And I started the disability reading group here at the Data Society. And we had three meetings this year. And it's a chance to bring disability studies discourse into different fields like academia or tech fields. And it's also a chance to give platform for my friends who identify as disabled person to have opportunity to share their work with the researchers here. And each time I collaborate with artists or scholars who identify as disabled, and that fact of collaboration, uh, equal collaboration is incredibly important. And I'm super happy to say Chansey Fleet, who's in the room. Raise your hand, Chansey. Hi. Ch Chansey is gonna be the incoming fellow um, this year after me. And she's going to be leading the disability reading group. 
and she does a lot of things, but one of which was uh, she serves at the National Federation for the Blind, and she's going to be connecting a blind community to the research that we do here at Data Society. So I'm super excited about it. And I think a lot about maintenance, and I think about like maintaining a project is really <laughs> much more difficult than starting a project. And if the project goes on without you, I think that's success. <laughs> the disability discourse, impairment, and illness is not just for disabled people, it's for everyone. And I held a workshop called a Flower Arrangement Workshop. And it was a chance for the cohort to come together and learn to arrange flowers but in a way to talk about self-care and maintenance of the care, which leads to uh, the shared um, understanding that we are all fragile, like we are all dependent on each other. The last project that I'm gonna talk about is distributed web of care. So here and in a lot of places, you know, people analyze and criticize what's wrong with tech. I think that's really important. But I think it's also important to think about how can we build something alternative. So this is where the arts and design comes in, to imagine and to build. So there's a lot of things wrong with the internet today, but I think we could imagine a world where decentralized, distributed, and peer-to-peer -peer network could be other forms of communication and building community for us in the future. So I've been doing this project um, to focus on care, instead of control, and person instead of user, and unlearning instead of un machine learning. And I started a tiny fellowship out of my fellowship. <laughs> and the fellows are here now, but uh, basically I'm running a residency and a fellowship that is gonna be a form of institution itself. It's a place, an opportunity to embody these different types of network. And in this photo, there's a, about 10 people holding strings together with uh, stickers that are passing onto each other. We're trying to imagine what kind of distributed network we could be. And it was an interesting experience to bring computer scientists and activists and artists together and not talk about the policy or the what's wrong, but think about the vision and play together. It was great to involve Rishab, who was uh, another fellow um, who researched on privacy to be one of the speaker. And I'm fundraising for this project, and I'm selling shirts and hoodies, because for one, to raise money, but more importantly, I think this discourse, the critical aspect to tech, should be fashionable. Like, <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's more important than the money that I'm getting from this, is that I think people should wear about internet freedom and privacy and take ownership of that. So if you go to my site, the pre-sale ends in three days. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna wrap up to thinking about art as a research and then fiction and friction. So fiction is really important because in fiction, we can envision a future. We can think about ethics. We can talk about scenarios. In friction, we can talk about responsibility, accountability, and our reality. I have to say Data Society has been a really incredible community of rigor and care, just thinking about what we do and what the impacts are. And we can celebrate this care in a non-hierarchical way by publishing and collaborating. Yeah, the leadership here has demonstrated a lot of um, thoughtfulness in how the organization moves forward. And these are some of the folks that I want to just say thanks to who have inspired me, and especially the operations team who make things happen, and programs team organizing events like that, and other fellows and researchers like that. Um, I'm going to go back to school for poetic computation and do what I do, and do more performances and exhibition. But I hope to see a lot of you in those events. Um, coming up soon, I'm hosting a party at the Ace Hotel Ballroom <laughs> in July 29th about distributed web. And it's like a real party, but we're gonna talk about you know, these technical topics. Um, <laughs> so please come check it out. Um, it's, it's gonna be fun, it's gonna be free for all. And we'll be hosting a series of Skillshares at the hotel um, 
with some artists that I really admire um, to share some of the thoughts about what the internet could be. So thank you. Thank you so much, all three of you. It's been an absolute privilege to have you here with us, and I'm never letting any of you go. <laughs> um, now we're going to turn it over to questions. Um, are there questions for our speakers? Hello. Thank you all for your, for your presentations. They were interesting and informative, so thank you. Um, the question I had was really for the two of you. It's kind of related to what you both presented on. Um, something that you presented about was this kind of standard of ethics that you developed with a group. Um, you know, I'm not going to remember each of those principles, but there was accountability and other things. I've noticed in the in kind of in the technology industry across different types of organizations, there has been a push to do that. And I, I work for a consulting professional service firm. They do, they've done that, and I've seen other industry groups. Um, do you see any, and that's just great that people are aware of, of the need of that, and they're, and they're developing those. Do you see any kind of harmon, harmonizing across those different organizations, or maybe there's not a need to do that? But something I've just noticed is, as people develop those, it's great that there's a set of standards for people to look to and to use, but um, just, I've noticed myself, I wonder if there's any kind of effort to harmonize those across those organizations. And, and linking it to, to what you presented on, you know, you talked about um, kind of the individual and societies having the ability to, to inform that privacy and, and have a, a place in it. Do you see corporations that have more resources and more perhaps expertise than the common individual that are creating these tools and these standards to take up um, a position of helping societies do that versus just doing it for corporate America. So that kind of relates to both of your presentations. Um, so, and anyone that wants to <laughs> answer that. Um, I don't see a lot of efforts to specifically harmonize different statements that have been put out, but I do see a lot of interest in thinking about these issues. I think that in the current climate we're in, it's difficult to imagine a lot of government uh, help in the US anyway. Um, that's not true around the world. And no matter what, I think it's good to empower individual engineers that are building things to be able to say to their managers, I think we should invest in um, things that explain the decisions or audit the process or, or especially on those boundaries where we got the data. All of those investments in documenting things over time, I think there is an incentive to close them up and not have them looked at. But I think that the people who are building it have an opportunity to speak up. And when there are professional statements that they can point to, it just gives them some additional cover you know, when, they're, when they're advocating for that. But there's a lot of things you can do when you're the one building it. You can, you can build it for improvement and visibility. Yeah, um, so, so I'm gonna kinda restate your question and um, let me know if I, if I get it wrong. So the question is, um, do I envision companies um, somehow um, doing the work of, um, being that glue in society that's going to nudge them towards um, coming up with these kinds of community-based notions of privacy. Is that the question? Yeah, pretty much so. I mean, it's, it's, uh, what you're talking about is empowering individuals to exercise right. the people that right. are affected by this right. to have some solutions, strategies, tools for them to actually take some power and, and do something in terms of advocating for privacy as well to do that. But it's hard you know, when people are, there's not the structure perhaps in place or the resources or money right. for societies to, on the individual level to do that. So how right. do you, is there at least a part of responsibility and an interest in corporations to take up that mantle since they have some awareness around it and also the much more resources to do so? Okay, so so l let me talk a little bit about the um, motivations for, for my model. 
So the motivations for my model are kind of thinking from the perspective of computer scientists, computer scientists reflecting on the values that they're implicitly empowering, right? And the values that they're implicitly disadvantaging, right? So, so my kind of uh, perspective in this is that computer scientists need to make that more explicit, like when we think about creating technologies. And sometimes, uh, more often than not, those values uh, of disempowering people really come in conflict with the values of empowering companies. Right? Sometimes they're very much, uh, uh, the powerful and the disempowered are, you know, the, the, those are the two parties. Like it's people and people are the disempowered party and um, companies are the powerful party. So. So I'm kind of making the case that whatever computer scientists end up doing, there is a certain political commitment to that, right? So, and so we need to think carefully about that political commitment. I have my own opinions about that political commitment, but I'm making a case that um, one needs to be explicit about that political commitment. Hi, um, thanks so much for your presentations and your inspiring work um, over the past year. I had a question that sort of ran through um, the three. Um, picking up off Tayun's question about who gets to be incomputable and then Derek Shan's really useful sort of reinsertion of power into how we think about privacy standards. And it takes me back to where you started, Gina, which is I'm, I, it sort of bothers me this... Um, idea that we, we kind of tell this narrative about the way that algorithms are already here and already determining our lives. And the, the key one I find troubling is this idea that they're determining what jobs we get. I don't know if anyone in this room thinks that they got the job they got because of an algorithm. And I just wonder, I mean, it probably is that I think we probably all have some intuition about who might get jobs um, through algorithms. So it gets back to the PowerPoint and who gets to be incomputable. And so I just wondered if if any of you in sort of like that, that sort of standard thing which justifies that we do work in this field, you know, algorithms are here, we need to interrogate them, but whether we should maybe have some more caution about where we actually are in the deployment of these algorithms and the extent to which they're already embedded in a way that makes it seem more intractable than I think it really is. Mm -hmm. So where are we on the jobs front? Um, so I think many times people don't get jobs because of algorithms. For example, there's a list of candidates and it's sorted by some algorithm and the chances that someone on the first page of the results is gonna get it versus the last page. There's also whether you even heard about a job. You know, there's the, um, the wonderful work that ProPublica did was showing that some ads aren't shown to, to people. And um, I remember some things from Kathy O'Neill's book about a standard um, set of questions that was asked at many, many, many um, companies that was basically akin to a personality profile or almost a diagnosis tool for um, uh, mental health issues that was keeping someone from getting jobs at every single place. Um, so I don't know that we're all the way down the scary road, but I think we're far enough that, that you know, if you ask, are, are algorithms just being used to like advertise and recommend songs? No, <laughs> you know, they're being used in hiring and housing and criminal justice and big decisions about people's lives. Um, it is not as bad as it could be, but I think, I think it's, bad, it's bad enough that we're probably way past time to to insist on changes. Um, uh, yesterday would have been none too soon, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I kind of fluctuate between hope and despair. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I agree, we're, we're way into it. But, but sometimes I also remind myself that the United States is not the only country in the world, right? There's, uh, I want to see what's going to happen with GDPR and uh, how that's going to change things, if at all. Um, I'm not too hopeful, but I do have a few glimmers of hope. So I want to see if the GDPR, what kinds of new kind of you know power structures is it going to create? So. Um, just really quickly, I think a lot about unpacking the technical terminologies, and I th think literacy 
is a key to thinking about these um, unpacking the layers. And there's a lot of mysticism and <laughs> misunderstanding around these terms. And I think liter text literacy and reasons and logical skills will lead to more informed decisions at large. So unfortunately, we are well, well past time. I wish we had time for 10 more questions. But in fact, we do have time for that. If you can stick around um, and join us for the reception after this talk, which will begin in about 30 seconds. Um, but first, I would like to briefly thank all of our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you.